Hello hackers, welcome back to the race conditions module of Pwn College. I'm Jan and in this video we'll be talking about races in the file system. Right? Um, this is a kind of special uh, case of uh, race conditions or, or really of the strategy of exploiting uh, particular race conditions. If you recall, uh, an attacker exploits a race condition by changing the state that a program expects to be functioning in um, between the time that the program makes use of this state and the time that it modifies this state, right? So um, some assumption made by the program about the state ceases to be true because the attacker changed it, right? Um, and so to exploit the race condition, if, if there's a kind of unsafe assumption made by the program, the attacker needs to be able to impact the environment or the, the state of a program. And um, a common case of this is the file system. Now, of course, a file system is uh, a shared resource. And oftentimes, as an attacker, you would have access to parts of the file system that the victim program assumes aren't uh, being maliciously modified. Let's take a look. All right, here's an, an example um, program. This program writes a uh, script um, that, that basically just echoes safe, and then it execs that script. A very small, simple program, um, but this program is extremely vulnerable because in between this, when the file is created and after bin sh starts up and begins to execute it anything could happen to that file for example it might be replaced by any attacker that has access um, to do so all right let's take a look at how this might work um, by of course exploiting it actually let's uh clear out all of these windows okay awesome so i uh copied that source code into this file here basically a very simple program again all it does opens um the uh file that we give on the command line writes a shell script to it and executes it if we run it and give it an asdf file it'll print out safe all right so how do we exploit this well obviously uh i mean obviously but of uh of course we exploit this by replacing this file between the time it's created and the time that it uh is executed right um the program of course is written to assume that this file does not change but this file can change let's take a look all right so I must be running the command somewhere in a different window. One second, let me find it and stop it. Yep, I am. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. <laughs> so we run uh, the uh, program. It creates this ASDF file. So that's bin safe, uh, bin sh, and then echo safe. And then when it executes it, of course, it it prints out safe, and that's what it does. All right. Um. So what happens if we just try as often as possible to replace that file with a file um, that copies a, uh, a cats are flag. So we have this cat flag script, all right, cat slash flag. And what we're going to do is write a program that while um, that'll just loop Sorry, we'll write a uh, quick shell command that'll loop in an infinite loop and continuously copy cat flag over the ASDF file. And we're going to dash V and then boom, here it is. Just copying continuously over the ASDF file. Just a simple uh, loop. You could write this, of course, in Python. You can write it in C. You can write it in anything. I wrote it in bash. All right. And then... We're going to run this. And of course, that time we lost the race, right? It created the ASDF file um, and it executed before 
our other script was able to override it. That time we lost the race again. That time we won the race. All right, uh, pretty interesting, right? Because if you just look at how this uh, program works, it doesn't look like it should be unsafe. But because there are multiple things going on on your computer at the same time, because this um, is making security critical assumptions on a shared resource that is not immune from tampering, problems happen. All right, let's, um, of course, uh, this case was extremely uh, nice in the sense that there was a huge window of opportunity, a very long time between the time when this file is opened. By the way, once the file is open and there's a file descriptor, then we can move this file out of the way just fine or overwrite it. The, 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 this write goes to the opened resource. It, it, it has nothing to do with the file name anymore. So if we overwrite um, the file between this open and this write, um, we still win. The write won't overwrite our new file. Um, and basically, as long as we overwrite this file between the time it's open and between the time when after bin sh initializes itself, which takes a long time, many system calls, etc., all of that uh, Linux binary loading, um, and it finally opens the shell script that it wrote. We have all of that time to replace that shell script with our attack. All right, so let's tighten up that race. What if you make it less winnable? This is a much less um, uh, raceable program, right? Um, where basically we have a, we copy an echo and we just run echo safe, right? So we open bin echo, we open the file that's provided, we copy using send file bin echo to our new file, we close the file and then we execute, all right? Much uh, smaller, no bin sh. Uh, the moment that echo is opened here, it's game over right we've lost our, our window so our window is again between this open and then this exec l call the moment exec l is called we have now lost the race if we haven't replaced it between here obviously this uh window is much smaller there's no sh initialization um so it'll be much tougher to win let me show you first of all that it is tougher to win we're going to um uh, recall our FS1 example, right? That we can win fairly frequently. Um, let's actually uh, uh, let's see. Let's run it ten thousand times and see how, um, or two thousand times and see how frequently we win. Okay, here we go. I'm going to write this to a file called output. Then I'm going to use some commands to figure out that we win about half of the time. So we ran it 2000 times, about half of the time, our uh, attack running in this other window won the game for us. Over half of the time, that time, obviously there's some noise uh depending on what else my system is doing and so forth so that was this uh the original this this first example we won half the time let's see the second example how often we win that with just this simple attack obviously this is the i i, I implemented that uh, example as well here um and we expect to see a uh, less successful uh, attack. Let's give that a try. Instead of FS1, let's do FS2. And so right away, you can see there's a lot less, say, uh, pwn college, a lot less flags leaked. Um, and specifically, B1 out of 2,000 times, only 45 times, right? Let's try that again. Only 48 times, so that's fairly stable, right? We win much, much, much fewer of those races. So how can we do better? Well, the general idea is to slow things.
things down and specifically slow down the victim program, this vulnerable program. If you make it run slower, if you make it take longer between this and this, then um, we'll open that vulnerable window more. So let's see a couple of options. One option is reducing the scheduling priority of this process. There are um, uh, several ways to do this. Linux provides a utility and a system call. The utility, of course, uses this system call called NICE. Um, the idea is a program that is nice takes up um, is less demanding of your resources. So it is much more willing to be unscheduled. It's kind of telling the kernel, hey, run me in the background. If you need to execute other uh, commands, uh, pause my process and execute. Of course, we have a finite amount of cores, uh, many processes vying for attention. If you put um, a uh, program as nice, it will be much less likely to um, run all the way through. It'll be much more likely to pause to, to be paused to give other programs a chance to run. If it's paused right here during our vulnerable window, then we can win that race, right? Um, the way you use nice is just you put nice in front of the command you want to run and it will get uh, descheduled. There's also IO nice. It's the same nice is for uh, CPU. IO nice is for input outputs for your disk. So it'll be um, much less intensive on your disk usage. So let's um, take a look at what this does to our success. So here we do 2000 times, but now we will put nice in front of this. We still have the attack running in the background, copying cat flag over ASDF. Let's run this. Uh, and that did not help. It really depends, really depends on what your machine is doing I would not sure if there's a statistically significant uh, factor. Nice takes um, a priority between negative 20, which is uh, very, um, very high priority. I know it's confusing. It's a negative number, but it is uh, schedule me at all times. I absolutely need to run and 19. And uh, by default, if you just do nice, it'll put 10. 19 tells you, you know, just don't schedule me, only schedule me uh, if, you know, the computer isn't doing anything else, etc. cetera. Um, and it's not having a significant, statistically significant effect. Looks like we win four, uh, 33. Yeah, these aren't, let's see uh, about Ionice. Ionice has a um, class, class, uh, one, two, and three. Three basically just says use IO only when we are idle. Let's see if that, it didn't seem to have helped. It did not help. Um, well, depending on uh, what else the computer is doing, so let's actually, um, Let's uh, spin up a bunch of uh, oh, no. Let's spin up a bunch of uh, heart, uh, loops in C. All right, now we're using more CPU. So maybe a nice will actually have some effect unlike on a completely, uh, not really. Okay. Let's use up all of my CPU. Hopefully it'll still encode this video <laughs> that I'm recording. All right. Failed demo, that's okay. Sometimes this works, sometimes this does not work. It really depends on um, what type of race it is, what is going on in that window. If it was CPU heavy, nice would be much more helpful um, and so on. All right, um, in my practice before the recording, it worked great. 
Um, let's kill all of this. Make sure that that is... Um, that did not... <sighs> all right, there we go. I killed all of those, uh, our loops. All right. Um, unfortunately, uh, no nice friends. Let's see if actually nice should do nicely for our, uh, first one. So again, we run, uh, we win about half of the races of the first one without nice. Um, this one that, that actually calls bin sh and so forth. And with nice, even worse. All right. We're gonna move on from nice because we need to cover other topics. All right, all right. Nice didn't work out. Uh, you have to take my word for it. It does uh, sometimes. Um, another concept is uh, slow in, in terms of being able to slow down the program. If a program allows you to specify a path, you can slow it down by having a lot of directories in that path. Why does this slow things down? It slows things down because when you have to look into a bunch of directories, uh, when you specify something like slash blah, slash blah, slash blah, slash blah, slash blah, the Linux kernel has to go into each directory, look at the um, entries in that directory, identify the next one, go into that, look at, fetch that from disk, etc. It takes time, right? So you can build these super, super long paths to slow down that file access. So that when this happens, when exec L runs, it'll actually take a long time to find that file, giving you more time to replace it. Cool. Um, unfortunately, the Linux uh, kernel has a uh, path size limit of 4,096 bytes, right? Four kilobytes. Um, so that's still a very, very long path, probably sufficient for most uh, purposes but we can do even better. We can build this insane thing called a file system maze, right? Um, we uh, basically have a directory where the maze is, and then we create directories, uh, a, a set of directories that are nested in each other, a slash one slash two slash three slash four slash five, etc., culminating in a symlink back to the root and same with B blah, 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 blah culminating the symlink back to the root. And this allows us to, uh, using other symlinks that go to the end of each individual maze entry here, we can create a uh, path that goes uh, my maze A end, root B end, root C end. When this path is, um, uh, 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 resolved, what will actually happen, it'll go through my maze and then it'll follow a and then go a slash one slash two slash three slash four slash because a and just stores basically the text of the, um, of the actual path and the kernel will actually have to follow all of these dig in, then follow root all the way back. And then it goes to B end. And then it has to go through all of this again then it goes to root and this all takes enormous amounts of time. Um, there's only so much we can do here. Linux has a limit of 40 symbolic links uh, per path resolution, but each of these steps can be 4,000 long, right? So that's an enormous amount of directories that you can uh, force uh, the kernel to traverse. Let's take a look at how this impacts our success rate. So as a reminder, uh, let's not bother with nice. Okay, so out of 2,000 uh, iterations on this tight loop or uh, tighter um, attack, 
with just this uh, attack running, um, we succeed about 50 times out of 2,000, right? Let's look at a maze. I built this maze, right? So here is uh, my A, B, A and, B and, C and, etc. I actually did all through Z. In A, I have A slash one, slash two, slash three, and so on all the way up until a 100 and then i have the root symlink that goes back to my maze here it is and then if i dereference that i can go into b right and of course i very quickly fill up uh, the maximum size of a path. Um, but I can also, again, do a end. And that has, that goes all the way to the end of a, and there's a root thing there. So I can do a end slash root, b end slash root, c end slash root, d end slash root, e end slash root, F and slash root, G and slash root, E and slash root. Wait, I'm just gonna copy my other one because to discombobulate it to uh, type out all of it. One second. Here we go. Let's get out of the maze, bring up what I was executing, and then this exact same thing can be done here. So I go into the maze, I go to A end, back out to the root of the maze, B end, back out to the root C end, and so on. I go here up until S end, back to the root T end. I think this basically makes it 40 symbolic links. Again, there's a limit of 40. You can make it deeper each entry in the root. I only went up to 100, but that's not 4,000 bytes, obviously. So I could probably go deeper, but this is sufficient. This traversing this maze and then all the way back out and then reading that ASDF file that I've been overriding is going to take time. So again, before we succeeded 50 times out of 2,000, let's see what happens now. You can see quite a lot more flags flying. Boom. We upped our success rate by a factor of five. And we can, of course, make that maze even deeper to slow down the program more to um, get things even more reliable. The takeaway is if you want to win races more effectively, you need to find ways to slow down the program. Um, file system uh, races are super, super relevant. In fact, these uh, bugs occur to this day, these aren't uh, archaic uh, bugs that, that, that we're talking about historically. Last year, there was a time of check, time of use vulnerability found in Ubuntu's crash reporting system. Uh, if a program crashes and you get a pop-up saying, hey, this crashed if you're using Ubuntu, there was a time of check, time of use vulnerability in that in the Python code. Another thing is that these vulnerabilities and race conditions in general are not just C specific. A lot of what we talk about um, uh, overflows and so forth, they might not apply to, for example, Rust. This does very much, right? So uh, this Python code checked if the user um, could access the file path that crashed. Um, uh, and if they could not, access it if they sorry if they could not access it it creates a, a a new report file for the crash if they can access it then it goes in here and just parses it uh, uh happily parses it assuming that the user has permissions of course this is done at a different time than this and there's an attack window in between so the exploit of course is to make sure that the path is accessible to trigger the self condition, then quickly symbolically link whatever that was pointing to, to something else that you want to read. Um, 
And using this, you can read out arbitrary files on the file system, for example, for the purposes of this class slash flag. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that these uh, vulnerabilities are real, um, but I'm sure that all the practice problems you'll see will do a much better job convincing you of that than I can right now.